Are you done? <laughs> All right. Uh, welcome to uh, West Valley Center for Spiritual Living. My name is Reverend Clyde Goins. I'm the assistant minister here, and I want to welcome you here on this beautiful Sunday morning. So we have exciting news. Um, uh, welcome all the newcomers or, uh, visiting or visitors that are visiting. Um, so we are actually um, in our, our final stage of all of our work that we've done on, on restoring this beautiful spiritual home that we have. And this week we're putting in new carpet. So we are very, very excited about it. Um, so we need help today to clear the room out, to clear all the chairs out and everything out of here. And then if anybody is available if, um, to come back on Saturday so we can bring it all back in on, with the new carpet installed in the room. So very, very excited about that. And it's um, a long time coming, and so it is here. So I'm going to invite Gloria up. She is um, of, uh, part of the Projects of Love Committee, and she has an announcement. Um, so we tithe quarterly to local um, charity organizations. Come on up, guys. come on up. We tithe the local charity organizations um, once a quarter. And um, so she's going to share some information about a um, community that we're tithing to today, a nonprofit community. Hello, hello, all you beautiful souls out there. You are so remarkable. Listen, I would like to take the time today to um, just, how many of you guys know that Reverend Karen has a heart for uh, community outreach? So, a big heart for community outreach. And that's what we do behind the scenes in Projects of Love. So for this quarter, we've chosen um, Home for Goods to receive the donation. They are not able to be here today because on Sundays they do a low-cost dental clinic. They do have low-cost uh, immunizations, and they also do adoptions. Their pets are um, come from the uh, Maricopa uh, uh, County uh, Shelter, and um, they're, all their animals are at risk for euthanasia or homelessness. So their main goal is to not have any pets be euthanized in Maricopa County. Yay! Hey. I am so happy for that. Um, they provide um, meals, warm beds, and lots of love. And uh, their, their pets are uh, seen by a veterinarian, they're vaccinated, they're spayed, they're neutered, and they're implanted with a, a chip. So if you know anybody that wants to adopt an animal or you just guys just want to go down and see it, uh, please, you're welcome. They will welcome you. We're going to show a short video presentation that um, uh, Kelly put together for us. I thank her so much for that. I thank Veronica for uh, going down with me and doing the tour. Um, there are a couple of other ladies that work with us, and uh, Jenny and Dana. And so um, we're just working to make sure that Reverend Karen's visions come into fruition. Also, I'd like to remind you that all through the year, we do donate, uh, we put uh, little bags together for anybody that knocks on the door. So please remember to, if you're at the grocery store, pick up some uh, items that are non-perishable so that Reverend Karen can always have a bag ready. Thank you. So I just wanted to add that they are basically completely volunteer based. Um, they are always dependent on volunteers. I have everything from like a person who can just cuddle puppies and just hold them and make sure that they learn how to be held to um, people who can do walking. They try and teach these animals because they don't know anything about them. So they try and teach them how to walk on a leash. And their goal is to create a family for you, create an animal for you that adapts to your needs. So they don't know anything about these animals. So they train these animals how to be your pet. Um, they do not turn down any animals. And so they have products that they sell. I'm gonna go back and get a couple things. <laughs> um, low cost. And um, they do not turn away any animals. There's gonna be an image of like the ashes because a lot of the animals that are surrendered are on their last leg and they don't, they're not ready to be 
they can't be adopted. So they have, they keep these ashes there to honor them. They keep the animal there and they let them live out their life there and then they uh, cremate them and they keep it there. Almost like a little hospice situation. Oh, and I have some pamphlets. <laughs> and they're on Thunderbird and 32nd? 32nd and 32nd. Yeah. 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 Okay. yeah. 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 We'll leave some brochures at the table, at Ernest uh, Holmes' table, and also uh, you can go on the website and view uh, their, uh, all their services. Thank you guys so much. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. All right. So again, we, we tithe to our um, local um, communities once a quarter um, as part of our, our tithe out to the community. All right. So now's the time uh, we come together to remember our truth that we're whole, perfect, and complete just the way we are. So we're, we always start our service off by um, saying our vision statement. So let's say our vision statement together. We are a loving, joy-filled community honoring the many paths to God as we learn and live the science of mind principles. And so it is. Can you hear me? It's about Bradford. Now. About now. Can you hear me now? Yep. So open up your hearts and minds for Bradford's beautiful music and Reverend Karen's beautiful message. Thank you. Within my heart, I will wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord. Be still, my soul, be still. Be still, my soul, be still. Be still.
let us come together and open our hearts and our minds, letting go everything that brought us to this moment as we come together to receive God's message. We know that right here and now, that God is all there is. It is expressing itself in, as, and through me and each one of you in this moment, as it will be expressed through Karen, God's message to each and every one of us. We open our hearts knowing and our minds believing that all is good and all is God. And the message today originates in the mind of God and is being expressed through Karen. And with that great knowingness, we are so open to receive. We say, thank you, God. And together we say, and so it is. Taking as a starting point the idea that the essence of man's life is God, it follows that he uses the same creative process. Everything originates in the one mind, comes from the same source, and returns again to it. As God's thought makes worlds of people and worlds and peoples them with living things. So our thought makes our world and peoples in it with our experience. By the activity of our thought, things come into our life, and we are limited only because we have not known the truth. We have thought that outside things control us, when all the time we have had that within which could have changed everything and given us freedom from bondage. So this song was requested by a good friend of ours. And it's a wonderful, happy song. And it's spring, guys. We're supposed to be Twitter painted, right? Reverend Karen said that a couple of weeks ago. And so this is just part of our spring collection of songs. And um, it's a happy G chord, yeah. I know you're gonna enjoy it. Zippity doo da, zippity a. My oh my, what a wonderful day. Plenty of sunshine headed my way. Zippity doo da, zippity a. Mr. Bluebird on my shoulder. It's the truth, it's actual. Everything is satisfactual. Zippity doo da, zippity a. Wonderful feeling, wonderful day. So love and joy is our birthright, right? It originates from God. It's a spiritual law. And that's what this song is all about. So let me hear you guys really sing it this time. Are you ready? One, two, three, go. Zippity doo da, zippity a. My, oh my, what a wonderful day. Plenty of sunshine headed my way. Zippity doo da, zippity a. Mr. Bluebird's on my shoulder. It's the truth. It's actual. Everything is satisfactory. Zippity doo da, zippity a. Wonderful feeling, wonderful day. Wonderful feeling, wonderful day. Woo! There's a great way to begin the day. That was fun. Thank Zippity you. Zippity doo dah. I do have a predicament, though. Juliana, how much do you need to be sitting right there for half a sec? Could you step away? I have left my best glasses in my pink bag. If you would bail me out, everybody's going to be a lot happier. <laughs> 
Good morning. Welcome to the West Valley Center for Spiritual Living. I'm Reverend Karen Rice, and I am the leader of this community in such a way that I get revved up on Sundays with all this overpowering joy for, for presenting messages to you. And the message I have prepared for you today has a single word title, and I'll bet you haven't ever heard it before. Unless you read Holmes a lot, because I took it directly from Dr. Holmes, the title of the message is Originative. Originative. Now, apparently that was the word a long time ago, but Spellcheck argued with me a lot this week. <laughs> Spellcheck kept going, that's not what you're, you want. Oh, no, you're wrong. And it was calling me names and... You know, and you could add it to the dictionary. You know, in Word, you can add new words into the dictionary, but it was way more fun to fight it out, to duke it out with spell check. So uh, the quote from Dr. Holmes uh, says this, th this, is, this is what it says. The one seeking to use this power, what power would he be talking about? The power that's greater than we are, the way he always said there is a power for good in the universe and you can use it. Thank you very much. I knew somebody here would, would be able to finish that for me. So when you're seeking to the one that is seeking to use this power, that one must have some sense, some inward conviction that he or she is dealing with an originative creative law. An originative creative law. What an interesting statement because the law is that, um, that dynamic, the infinite intelligence of the universe, and we always go back to that original. Where did that power originate? It's a specific beginning where something has been initiated, and you know what? Every one of us has been initiated from this divine source because God has created all of life, including us as, as human beings. To, so to say there's an originative creative law is to say this is where everything began, right? It comes from the root word genitive. And from genitive, we get like to generate. We also get generations. We also understand the, the genetic code that we're born into. But we often forget that the genetic code we, that's most important for us to tap into that power and to use it is that divine gift gift of, of perfection that's somehow sort of hidden inside of us. And as we grow and learn and, and mature in spirituality, our goal is to uncover in, in increasingly uh, little increments our awareness of that uh, divine uh, genetic background that we come from. So it's a very specific beginning that we're always looking at. It's our point of origin. I think that's the simplest way to, to, to say it. Even the book of Genesis implies that in the beginning, and so in the beginning, God. In the beginning, we recognize that God is. So... That's what we're going to talk about. We're going to look at that today. How do we tap into that power? Um, how do we um, uh, recognize and own the way that we have been divinely generated into being who we are? And then we got to play. We got to be co-creators in our own life with, with God at the, at the helm, so to speak. When we recognize that divine genetic makeup of our of our originative power, then that's when we absolutely know and live our lives in that direction, in that energetic, that there's some, something wonderful happening through me right now. Remember that affirmation? There's something wonderful happening through me right now. Say it with me out loud. Something wonderful happening through me right now. Absolutely. Amen. <laughs> oh, you don't need much prodding today. Yay. <laughs> uh, so we are divinely inspired. There is this way that, that God breathed the breath of life into us. I like to say that spirit kissed us into being. And so that is not lovely. So that divine inspiration is that breath, that, that movement of life that, that uh, allows us to, 
to stay connected to source and continue on this journey. Those first seven words from that Ernest Holmes quote where he said, the one, the one seeking to use this power, those seven words, the one seeking to use this power, that power is that, that which is always happening within us. But what he's saying when he goes on to talk about con the conviction of it, what he's really telling us is that we got to stir up some in some way, we want to stir up our inward conviction, that inner conviction that we're born with. And so that's what we do on Sunday mornings. That's why I'm a little bit excited today. I've been rehearsing the talk since 4 a.m., you know. I'm stirred up with my inward conviction, and I want you to leave with a little bit of that today as well when we stir up our awareness of 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 the, these divine truths about how we are so perfectly made when we when we do that it's like stoking the fire so sometimes we use that image of there's a little flame within us the flame of truth that can never go out and you know, if you've ever had a fireplace, that the fireplace often has sitting on the hearth a shovel and a poker, right? And, the poke, and they're heavy. The poker is heavy. And we use that to stir the embers, to stir the coals, to move the logs around so that we can get the fire going again. And remember in the old days, they had that, that I, I've seen it in movies, so that, the bellows, yes, so that you, you put the air on it, and then that stirs it. All those things come together if we put enough fuel on that fire to make the flame big again. And that's what we do when we uh, look for spiritual inspiration, whether that's your personal spiritual practice or the way we gather in community. We're stirring those coals. We're fanning that flame. We're throwing another log on the fire because we, we want to really get the all awake and aware of that inner quickening that's purely divine, the movement of the Holy Spirit at the core of our very own being. I was thinking... As I was contemplating writing this message, I kept thinking about this Dr. Seuss book <laughs> I, that I always have a copy of. This is not the copy my children read. This is not the copy my grandchildren read. I had to buy myself a brand new copy of this book, Dr. Seuss, Oh, the Places You'll Go. I had to buy a new copy of this book when uh, one of my early weddings, when I was first ordained as a minister, um, uh, that bride and groom requested that I read from this book. So I want to read you um, uh, one of the short. Did you love Dr. Seuss when you were a kid? I can so remember teachers reading us Dr. Seuss in the classroom, the first and the second, maybe the third grade, you're still getting Dr. Seuss because he did graduate to more mature poems. And this is one of those poems that's not an early reader. He says... You have brains in your head. You have feet in your shoes. You can, you can steer yourself in any direction you choose. You're on your own, and you know what you know, and you are the one who will decide where to go. Yeah, yeah. You get to decide where you're going to go. So... What we forget sometimes is that there are, are always those stirrings within us. And sometimes we feel like life whips us around or we move through a storm in a relationship, whatever it may be. But we forget that we have, we have a brain in our heads and we have feet in our shoes. To say that you have feet in your shoes means that we know somehow there's an intuition within us that knows how to move through a storm. We put one foot in front of the other. And then eventually we come out on the other side of that. So your brain thinks, but your brain doesn't go rogue. I mean, unless it's got a dis-ease, right? Your brain doesn't go rogue. 
it's our mind and the way our minds think. And it's when we relinquish all um, direction to which way our thoughts are going to go, then we tap into the general consensus of the, 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 the I want to call it mucky, the, just the, the consensus of that things always have to be a certain way or what the general public, um, it's spiritual metaphysicians called it, the consciousness of the human race. You fall into that when you are not consciously directing your, your thoughts or steering your ship, so to speak. So that uh, poet uh, Ella Wheeler Cox, most people are familiar with at least this line from her poem that said, um, the, um, the ha, um, oh, I guess I didn't leave myself a, a clue. Ella Wheeler, you know, you, uh, the, it's, the, it's the set of the sails, not the force of the gale that directs you, right? It's the way you, it, the poem actually starts out by saying one ship's going east and one ship's going west and, and, they're, and they're using the same wind, but they set the sail in a certain way so that they can go in a direction that they are choosing. And that's what we're talking about today. We're talking about making that choice and choosing the direction. And so the, the, the set of the sail what does your spiritual uh, uh, belief look like? What does your spiritual practice look like? That is, that's how you're setting your sails. That shows up in your attitude. You can hear it in the words you say and the kind of things you complain all the time to other people about. So everybody has their own little sort of soft spot where, we, um, where we're more sensitive but we get to set the sail. And if you don't like the direction you're going in, you, can, you get a, a do-over. You can do it again. So you've got brains in your head, um, and you can contribute to the, way, the direction of your thoughts. You see, the, what we know now, because we have all this study, all the neuro, neuroscience uh, information that's being released, by the way, it's so prolific that they say it gets updated like er, if you have a year old something that there's something more current you could probably be researching it's just a little harder to access it um, but they what they tell us is that the the thoughts that we think especially the repetitive thoughts create n actual pathways neural pathways in our brain and so if you have a bad habit that you've been doing for a long time you have a pretty deep path there right because what makes a path what what creates the path is is the frequent use of that that way of going that particular way we used to have a dog in our home in Los Angeles area, and behind the wall was the boulevard, and when kids would go down the sidewalk, we couldn't see it. It was a pretty deep drop, so you'd never see anybody's head or nothing. But the kids on skateboards made the dog crazy. She hated that sound, and she would bark and run back and forth, back and forth, and there was a path there for th that lasted her entire life. She, she loved keeping that path clear, just, and she didn't do it intentionally. It's just how we use it, and that's what our brains do. Your brain, you keep thinking the same negativity, then you've got a path that your brain will default to go to um, if, you're, if you're not really being intentional in, in your uh, life, in the choices you make and in choosing the direction you want to you wanna go. So I notice we, we like paths. Paths are not necessarily bad. We, uh, we like to go on a mountain trail or we have a lot of hiking paths here in the desert even. We love, I love to go to the central coast of California and find that beach with the excellent boardwalk that just goes for about two miles and you can, and you can follow the path. And the reason we like that, I, I think, I don't know, I just made this up. This is not neuroscience. This is <laughs> Karen thinking. Um, I think the reason we like that is because we choose the path that we want to walk, whether we're familiar with it or not, we choose the path, and we don't have to do a lot of thinking. We can meander. We don't ha we're not thinking about a destination as much as we are enjoying the journey. And so I like to compare that to the way we move through uh, uh, along our own spiritual path. And, you know, and sometimes you switch it up. You got to do something a little bit different so that you can get a different flavor of what, what else you might be missing, what else is out there that we might uh, want, to, want to explore. So um, 
paths are fun and paths are good, but paths that get us stuck, especially when it's a neural pathway and you can't see it, you don't even know it exists, but the way you can tell is how quickly somebody says that and you jump over to that, right? That's a neural pathway that's been, that's been dug. So today, should I, for any reason, say something that makes you a little uncomfortable, I want you to notice that. Grab it and realize it's a gift. It's a gem that you are holding in your hand because then you can question later, why does that trigger me? What, 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 in what way does my neural pathway want to reject that idea? It doesn't mean you have to change your mind and it doesn't mean that everything I say is, is relevant or valuable because we are all individuals. So you're going you're gonna to do that, um, right? Yes? Okay, thank you. At least four of you are going to do that. Yeah. I'm happy. I'll take four. Um, so a thought is a movement of information in your mind, and every thought signals our body, and our body creates a, a physiological response, right? So the classic examples they usually use in psychotherapy um, you, you, you go to get in your car, it's, uh, it's dark still, or it's getting dark, or the sun is just coming up, and there's a hose nearby that's wrapped up, and for a, for a split second, you think it's a snake, and then your body has a response, right? You gasp, or you back up, your hands might get clammy, or your breath is shallow, right? Your body has a physiological response, and even after you notice, oh my gosh, th I left the hose there last night, that was me, silly me, and you're laughing, your body, your heart is still thumping really fast, right? And you're still, it, it'll take a while for your body to, to calm down again, because you signaled it. So I read this, in preparation for this message, I read that when your, um, um, when your thoughts are in any way connected to your heart, then you are more likely to have a warm and, um, um, call, uh, Holmes says warm and, and uh, that we should add feelings to our thoughts. That's when our thoughts are most, most powerful, when we add warmth and color and imagination. Now, you can do that in a negative way, but if you do that in your heart, in a tender way, if you allow yourself the vulnerability of feeling tenderness, of feeling that tenderness, then your, your, your thoughts are going to generate feelings that are going to be similar to whatever the tenderness is. It's love, or it's joy, or it's some kind of tranquil peace. It's the way you can then see the beautiful sense of order in the universe or in your neighborhood, in the life around you. When your thoughts are connected to your heart and they have that warmth and that color and that, and that, and that God stuff in them, you are, that, those are the moments you are closest to God because that is what God is. God is love. God is peace. And God is that perfect order. God is light. That's why we have a divine illumination. That's why all the mystics say that the elevated thoughts or the Godward gaze, the upward thinking, that's where you touch God because you're touching the thoughts of God. So we are closest to that originative source when we are aligned to those God thoughts. So play with that. A God thought, Holmes says this a lot, so do other metaphysicians, spiritual philosophers, that it's an upward spiral ever and ever expanding. So here's an example of one of the quotes c that Holmes used a, a lot. The creative power responds to feeling more quickly than any other mental attitude. That creative power that we were taught, the originative law, the so original source, that creative power, responds to feeling more quickly than any other mental attitude. Our mental acceptance should be filled with conviction, warmth, color, and imagination. And I'm telling you, he repeats that in so many ways, in lectures and books and, 
and um, all the writings we have from him and recordings. So it's a good practice when you're meditating to sit and just watch your thoughts, right? You're, you get up in the morning and you have your spiritual practice, whether that is a 45-minute formal meditation or you, you're willing to sit in the quiet, in the stillness. Be still and know God even for five minutes. When you're sitting in that quiet, just notice what your thoughts are and don't have any judgment. We, we often say when you notice how negative, you're like, well, I just woke up. Why do I have all that negativity in my brain? You know, I'm, trying to, I'm sitting here doing a spiritual practice. What the heck's that going on in, in there, you know? When you notice that, don't have judgment. You didn't do anything wrong. You're just clearing out all the other energies so that you can tap into your heart so that you can see the joy and the beauty and the, the gifts of God right in front of you. Have immense self-compassion for yourself when you notice you're having a hard time sitting peacefully in the stillness because there's a gift there. I'm reading this fabulous book. I took it on vacation with me. And I found it because somebody in my life recommended another book to me. And by the way, if you have not heard of this other book, um, the author is Arthur Brooks. And the other book that somebody recommended is called From Strength to Strength. And it's a book, you're going to love this author, Nancy Noel. It's another book that uses all this, the brain studies, you know. And he, the purpose of that book is to uh, help us understand how our own brains change as we age. And it's really encouraging. It's really a gorgeous gift to say, oh, sure, your memory might not seem to be what it is, but, um, but here, look what else is happening. Well, here's what we know now from Strength to Strength, uh, Arthur Brooks. So that's a book you might be interested in. However, that's not the book where I pulled all this information from. You know how you get that book and then you're reading and you're going, oh my gosh, look, at he wrote this book too. And then I had to you know, get online and order this book too. And so the book that I'm quoting from this morning is called um, something different than that first name. Um, oh, oh, it's a great title. Actually, it's a scary title. I actually admit I don't really like the title. I almost didn't buy the book because of the title, Love Your Enemies. <laughs> and the book was written um, to, help, to help us make sense of the current culture of contempt in political attitudes in the United States. Now, this is a wonderful opportunity. I've been looking for weeks how to say this to you. If you think that means we're talking about politics, you have gone down some neural pathway that you're going to miss the whole point of what I'm about to say. Right? This is not a talk on politics. I bought this book because I'm a spiritual leader, and I have to know how to guide people through this stuff. Whew, that was such a close call. <laughs> um, so um, the, the first quote, the first poll that I wanted to share with you, um, s and this is fairly current information, 93% of Americans say they are tired of how divided our country has become. 93%. 71% of all the people in the whole study, 71% actually checked the box that said, I am extremely tired of the split, of the great divide. D do you know what that tells me as a spiritual leader? So I am always talking about the bell curve and Pareto's principle and the 80-20 principle, right? I'm always chatting about that because I think it's important. I want you to know that most of us are in that middle, that 80%. We are not the loud, nasty voices on both sides of what any issue. You could pick a topic and there's going to be two sides to it that are, uh, seem more heated. And basically because of social media, it, it feels like the voice, I think the voices are louder. I'm not going to say it feels like it. I think that social media, I know, put it in my face. I had to start filtering what I was willing to read on social media because I'm not, I don't want to give it up. There, there are benefits from it too. But I didn't like how it almost doesn't matter what you posted. We posted when, I, when my, grand, my great granddaughter, um, Shay, 
was about nine months old, 10 months old, and they came to visit last fall. And the family, we took videos of her, and she's sitting in the high chair that my kids sat in and that her mom sat in. I have this high chair in my dining room that I'm never going to part with. And so we put baby Shay in this generational um, um, high chair, and we took a video of her eating corn on the cob, and I was talking to her, and, and, she, and it, it, it went wild. It got mega, I don't know how, but it was one of those that, you have 5.2K hits, you know, or whatever. Um, and, but it is really cute, and you can hear me in the background going, Baby Shay, Baby Shay, is that delicious? And then she'd go, mm-hmm, and she's just eating this, and it's messy, it's so adorable. And some total stranger posted this whole thing that said um, that baby should not be eating corn she could choke and do 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 it's like who the hell are you <laughs> why, why would you rain on our parade what does this have to do with you right and that so that's kind of how the world is and I did not plan to share that story today but <laughs> but it's a good so can you see I'm heated about it can you see how it stirs it's easy to amen right <laughs> don't talk bad about my grandkids or their parents all right, so um, what, what the research is showing us is that the problem isn't that people have differing views. We always have different views. They say politicians used to go to dinner together after their big you know, fights in the daytime in all the voting meetings and stuff, and then they'd go to dinner and laugh it all off, and now they can't even be seen sitting with somebody that's an opponent. Right? We're so divided that it would be risky for them to be friends with somebody that everybody else hates. So there, the world has changed, and the book was written because the problem is not disagreement. In fact, we know that disagreement creates um, a greater possibility for excellence. Ask anybody that's been married more than a couple decades. <laughs> How did you stay together? It wasn't because they never fought, right? It's the, it's the arguing. It's the disagreeing. It's the way that we, if you're going to stay in that relationship, you have to reprioritize your values again and again and again because we don't grow at the same pace. We grow and we change. And a, a, a marriage or a relationship that lasts a long time is an, a beautiful example of how the excellence shows because you're um, taking the rough edges off as you bump into each other. So they say disagreement is not the problem. The problem is the rise of contempt. You know, how, you know what contempt is? It's hatred. It's disdain. One of the sources said that uh, it's a full conviction of the worthlessness of another human being. And that's what the division is. That's the name calling, and that's how it's gotten to where it's that 93% of the population says enough of this great divide. This is a horrible thing. So I want you to think about it because probably just about everybody in this room would be quick to say, I don't think I have contempt, though. I don't hate. Well, I want to tell you something. <laughs> True confession. <laughs> I hate butter. <laughs> Raise your hand if you already knew that. Yeah, look around the room. A whole bunch of people know. I hate <laughs> butter, right? But my hatred of butter, for whatever reason, I, I don't even know why I don't like butter. My hatred of butter does you no harm. And if you should, like uh, Juliana, baked, you baked, she baked a pie. I think it was a pie for here at church. And with the awareness that the minister doesn't like the taste of butter, she used, I don't know, shortening or oleo. <laughs> shortening, she confessed. Shortening. Right? And so it was delicious for me. And I doubt that any of you really missed the taste of butter in it because she's a damn good baker. She's a damn good baker lady. We're blessed to have her. All of us used to weigh a lot less. <laughs> we love Juliana. Oh, so social scientists have been looking at this idea of what's going on with this. Um, um, wh why, why do we demonize the things that we don't like or uh, people that disagree with us. Here's what we know, and this is why I wanted to bring this up today. Here's what we know about contempt, and none of this will be new to you, but I'm going to package it in the way the researchers did. 
When you carry around within you that kind of hatred for anything or anyone, I'm not talking butter here. I'm talking all the, the bigger issues. When you carry contempt, you will not feel joy because joy and hate cannot reside at the same time in the same being. When you carry contempt, you are damaging your own health. And you know what they said? These, the research, this is their words. It makes us unattractive to have hate in us. Think of somebody yelling at you. Can you I, I actually have a face in my mind. Sometimes I still think my mom's yelling at me. <laughs> she put that finger in my face. You know, I, I deserved it. I'm just going to admit that. But, you know, it, it is, they, the researchers said, it makes you unattractive even to the people that, that agree with you and support your beliefs. So have you ever seen a picture somebody took of you where you weren't, where you weren't happy and you're kind of embarrassed by how, awfully you, how awful you looked? Yeah, it's, it's, it's unattractive. So here they, here they go further. They, say, they give these four, um, uh, four things that happen when we experience contempt when you when you have it when you're carrying it in you um they they say it, they worded it here as a, the strong emotion of hate number one it alters your behavior right you're not going to behave as um the same way as if you were heart-centered it impairs your cognitive processing your brain cannot reason on logical facts that are sitting in front of you your brain is being controlled by whatever point you're trying to make that's uh, anti somebody else or something else on on an opposite from an opposite view number three it damages self-esteem not just to the people you're being mean to but it damages our own self-esteem to carry hatred around and number four is probably the most important from my view contempt causes uh, comprehensive degrading of our own immune system so we know stress is not healthy for us. It, it, it compromises our immune system, but hate ups the ante even more. It makes it even harder. So we have to decide. You have a brain and you have feet. Decide which way you're going to go. Notice those responses in, inside of you. The new studies coming out of neuroscience say that, oh, this is stunning. This is uh, scary stunning. The new studies coming out of neuroscience say that neuro, uh, neurologically, contempt changes your brain in the same way drug addiction changes your brain. So contempt, the damage that comes from contempt from us carrying hate around is equal to the damage of any kind of substance abuse we might do to ourselves. Someone asked the Dalai Lama once, your holiness, what do I do when I feel contempt? It's a good question. It's a really good question. What do I do when I feel contempt within me? And his answer was practice warm-heartedness. Right? That, that brings us full circle back to these opening quotes from Dr. Holmes and in spiritual philosophies of, of every faith. It is the way we respond to life that creates the feelings. Contempt does not um, 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 generate feelings of love or you can't see beauty, you won't experience joy. But when we're warm-hearted, Remember that we're, it's, we're one with, with that source, that originative source. And so love and joy and beauty and order are natural for us to recognize. It's as though it clears our vision. Warmth, color, and imagination. See, if you think originative source, it takes us back in the most basic way to this great, great truth. There is a power and a presence. It's greater than we are, and we can use it. 
And it is never missing, no matter what's going on in the middle of the most heated arguments. God is right there. In the middle of the worst tragedy, God is still there. We have been angry because we think that the job of God is to save us from all of that stuff. And if we just do so many things in a proper way that we then will be part of the evacuation and we'll make it way up there to that heavenly loft and we miss the whole point of what it's supposed to be like living here. We have tools and that's what this teaching is about. So I have one final point, one fabulous final point. If you can't figure out, which I totally can't, if I'm mad, don't even tell me to remember what I spoke about this Sunday, right? <laughs> <laughs> right? Right? It's a big mistake. Um, so it's challenging, but the research tells us there's a way we can get to warm-heartedness when we're not feeling it, and that is fake it. So that old fake it till you make it thing, fake it. Science! A long time ago, I'm going to tell you about a study that was done in 1993. Do you realize that was 30 years ago? <laughs> I know, I know. Oh, I know, it's crazy, isn't it? How could that be? So this study was done by a couple of research psychologists, Ekman and Davidson. You can look it up. The title, I did. The title of the study is Voluntary Smiling Changes Brain Activity voluntary smiling. Do you know what they did? They took volunteers and they put the electrodes on them so they could run an EEG and see the activity of the brain while this is going on. And it, they would ask the volunteers to force a smile. You don't even have to be happy. Force a smile. Do it. Try and smile. Force a smile for 20 seconds. I'm not going to make you do it. I thought about it, but I knew, this, I knew, we, it, I knew we were going a little long today. I had too much material. <clears throat> Try it at home or in the car. Count while you're smiling and you're driving. Everybody will think you're crazy, but, you know, smile for 20 seconds. It changed the brain. And then they did the same thing where they exposed the volunteers, the same people, to really funny stuff. And so they measured the brain activity of the forced smile, the manipulated smile, they called it, compared to the spontaneous smile, and they were exactly the same. The brain activity was the same. The muscles that we use to smile trigger something in our brains. This is really good stuff. And the same is true for other emotions as well. They didn't test just smiling. The same is true. Fake it for 20 seconds. That means if you're walking around with a sad face for a day and a half, woo, <laughs> fake it and do something quick. <laughs> the... Uh, Physiological effect of the brain was the same in both cases. So here, here was their end result. Even a forced smile activates the happiness center of your brain. So there's something we can use. We can use it right now. But here's a gorgeous quote from Thich Nhat Hanh, another Buddhist. Sometimes your joy is the source of your smile, but sometimes your smile can be the source of your joy. Is that fabulous? Don't forget that. That's a good one. The conclusion of the studies, um, I'm going to read the quote right from the book, Love Your Enemies. The conclusion was this, and this is so beautiful. We don't have to feel unity and brotherhood. We simply need to act in the spirit of unity and brotherhood, and the feelings will follow. Just act in the spirit of unity and brotherhood wherever you go. Do the best you can. And when you get crazy and you feel the contempt guy rising, you know, I think it takes a lot of spiritual maturity to be able to identify it in you, so keep trying. <laughs> keep looking to recognize it and play with the lesser emotions where you're just a little angry and try these experiments and see if they don't change your day. An originative source has equipped us to be able to practice these skills. 
and ori originative, the original source that created all of life, has put something within us that allows us to be able to steer our, our feelings, to redirect our thoughts and bring us to the end result of, of, of a life that we much desire. And that's what I wanted to say today. <laughs> so we've been quickened, touched by the Holy Spirit. We have sat in sanctuary together, whether you are hearing this remotely or you're sitting right here in this building. The presence of God has been palpable. For when two or more gather in the name of good, something wonderful unfolds. It is this thing called life. And so in this very moment, this beautiful, powerful moment of the, the spoken words of prayer, the holy words of prayer, I feel the love of God right here, right now, right, right where we are. I feel the presence of God's sweet love. It is that activity of life within us. It is that which gives birth to the wisdom so that we might make decisions that are holy decisions that we might direct our minds in new ways, that we can change the neural pathways in our brains so that we, are, uh, 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 we, we bring good qualities, we bring God qualities into our life and therefore onto this planet. I feel the, the love of God and I know it is that deep intuitive call that there's no place where God is missing or limited. And therefore, wherever we go, and oh, the places we may go, we have a brain that thinks, and we have feet in our shoes, and we have thoughts that we can intend so that we choose the direction and that the storms in life do not blow us very far off course for we get quickly back to where we were headed. For we have an originative source that we have never been disconnected from. So we feel that, that love of God. We feel it and we sense it and it is indeed warm and colorful and imaginative. And in fact, as we tap into that mind of God, even grander possibilities reveal themselves to us right now. So whatever it is in our human experience that has ailed our, our, our physical bodies, we know that that intelligence is quickened by the sounds of these words. We put our firm command on that originative law and we generate new health in our bodies. Even now, there is healing unfolding. And if there is in any way something that has been blocking your mind from seeing the beauty in the world and the goodness that's possible and the way that things break apart only so that God can piece them together in a better way, we just allow the Holy Spirit to reorganize the thoughts in our mind and we can begin to create beautiful neural pathways that bring more good into our lives and into our world. We look at the negative thinking we have had in the past and we say, get behind me negativity. For there is good that desires to be expressed in our individual lives. And today we just open ourselves to be filled with that grace of God, to allow the Spirit itself to just pour that grace into our being so that we are vessels. We are ready to receive that good so that it can be multiplied and we can extend it out to 
all those that we love and to every encounter we have for we know that every encounter is indeed a holy encounter and I know that the full blessings of spirit the grace of God is also in the spiritual community and I give thanks for that I am so grateful to see it in the faces to feel it as I meet new people to know that we thrive because we are willing to look at how remarkable we truly are and so even as we have been kissed into being we rest in this beautiful spirit of inspiration from on high I say thank you God thank you infinite spirit for all of these new ways of seeing these spiritual tools we can use and for this gorgeous life that is freely given and in that spirit of deep deep gratitude we simply release the words of this prayer into that dynamic law that originative law we let it be, and together we say, and so it is. Amen. Amen. Grateful, grateful, grateful for all the love that I have. I am so grateful, grateful, grateful for all the love that I have. Everywhere I look and every face I see Is love reflected shining back to me I just give thanks for all these simple things The joy and peace that gratitude brings That's why I'm grateful 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 for all the love that I have I am so grateful Grateful All right, thank you, Bradfords. So we've learned something today. Fake it. <laughs> Tell me all about it. <laughs> all right, so now's the time to celebrate the abundance of our lives, the abundance of our community. Um, so we are not passing around the offering plate. We have drop boxes in the back of the room on the way to Papke Hall for um, people visiting. We have fellowship afterwards with snacks, and please join us. Um, so we have a beautiful day, in this, um, and we are blessed for all of your um, donations and tithes, so we appreciate that. So let's say our giving affirmation together. I live in a consciousness of good. Divine love blesses and multiplies all that I am, all that I have, all that I give, and all that I receive. Thank you, God, and so it is. <laughs> Please rise for our last song.
Only got one life to live in the moment. Feels good, don't it? Feels good, don't it? Only got one life to live. Oh. To be alive. Woo! All right. <laughs> Thank you, Bradford. Uh, just a quick reminder, run over, get some snacks, run back in here and help us stack these chairs and move them out of here. We're, we're packing it up. All right, so let's say our um, closing affirmation together. I am divinely inspired. I am divinely inspired. I choose to express more life and more love. And so it is.